called smuggler ants. They just bring in a few kilos here, a few kilos there, and in some places only a few ounces. Uh, difficult, uh, difficult bit of the trade to get into because it's constantly changing. Having cleared customs and immigration, the suspect was arrested. The huge international trade in drugs has become the biggest problem for those fighting organised crime. The police response will never cope with the trade in drugs. The best we can do is slow the rate of increase. A good day for the police is a day the problem doesn't get any worse. Two kilos of heroin were strapped to the body of Vilom Prashar. He was later sentenced to eight years in prison. I've got the surveillance team uh, jacked up for tomorrow evening at six o'clock. They'll be coming up to the yard to be briefed. The drugs trade brings many problems. Scotland Yard has a special unit devoted to drugs-related violence. There is no doubt that the greater the profits, um, the greater uh, will be the motivation to defend your profits uh, and indeed to go on uh, and to increase them. So if the stakes are very high, and they are very high, then the propensity to violence uh, will increase uh, at a commensurate rate, and that sadly is the, uh, is the current picture. A dealer selling crack cocaine to a female undercover police officer. The drugs are collected for evidence by a detective who's been hiding in an adjoining room. This was Operation Motion, run by Scotland Yard to counter the growth of violence related to drugs dealing. The unit was set up um, in the early 90s uh, to deal with the explosion in crack cocaine. It's expanding, becoming much more violent. There is massive amounts of money to be made in that particular commodity. Um, so a lot of our work is actually aimed at crack dealers. The police turned a flat in a respectable building into what appeared to be a brothel. We manned that with a couple of undercover women who were police officers, uh, with a minder who was a police officer, and we basically just phoned up these yardy crack dealers and invited them to come down, uh, and if they had drugs and were selling drugs, to sell them to us in this brothel. This chap's called Sooty, that's his street name. Um, this is his first occasion down, and uh, the girls are making him welcome. You'll find that he conceals his drugs um, down his underpants. In fact, maybe further up his underpants than, uh, than that. We, we never quite found out. She's had a problem with this guy. He's, he's been late. She's chastising him in a friendly way to um, remind him that the next time he comes, he'd better be on time. Because um, if this had been a real-life brothel scenario, instead of a police sting, then quite obviously the brothel person wouldn't have been very happy with having to wait hours for uh, any drugs they wanted. Obviously undercover techniques are established now and they're being used widely. Um, and I personally use that technique with girls and positively aim at using their sexuality uh, where I can. But obviously within strictly controlled guidelines and uh, within advice we get from our legal people. This chap, Mr. Young, uh, was also late, and uh, he was very anxious. On his way down to this plot, there were a lot of uniformed police officers around. Had absolutely nothing to do with us whatsoever. It's generally been a very stressful day for him. Unfortunately, it gets a lot more stressful. And as he leaves, unfortunately for him, he's about to get hit by an arrest team. <laughs> I was very, very concerned right from the very beginning for the girl's safety and that was why we put uh, a police officer in to look like a pimp in case something had gone wrong, in case the drug dealers got violent. 
in fact, in case the drug dealers uh, became over-friendly, shall we say, because they thought they were talking to professional prostitutes. At the end of the day, we arrested 36 of these dealers and they were all convicted with the corpse able to see exactly what we were doing in the brothel, everything recorded on video. My job is to push the boundaries as far as I can without putting the officers here at risk and that if we step over the bounds of what is lawful then that is my responsibility and the responsibility stops here. The methods employed by Commander Greaves' criminal intelligence branch to achieve their considerable success include informants, undercover officers, surveillance and technical devices they won't even discuss. They could be a worry if they were not strictly controlled. Yes, this is morally difficult territory. This is, uh, this is at the edge of what is possible, but uh, we look at the law uh, and we try to do all that we can lawfully to bring these criminals to justice. And the Court of Appeal have provided us with some very precise and powerful guidelines which we follow in our use of informers, in our use of technology, in our use of, of gathering evidence and in the relationship between intelligence and evidence. The drugs dealers on the streets of London are only bit part players in international and organized crime which has become a worldwide business. In many ways, uh, criminals have taken advantage uh, of free movement uh, at a pace which is ahead uh, of the reaction, certainly of conventional uh, law enforcement, certainly of the, of the legal processes. So London is inextricably uh, an international city, an international crossroads, and we are vulnerable in the same way as any other major international centre to the increasing activities of international organised crime. In the drugs trade alone, London is a focus for criminal organisations from all over the world. They import ecstasy-type drugs from the Netherlands, amphetamines from the Netherlands, France and Belgium, heroin from the Golden Crescent via Turkey and the Balkan route, cannabis resin from Pakistan and Morocco, herbal cannabis from Jamaica and Western and Southern Africa and cocaine from Venezuela and Colombia. But perhaps London's biggest involvement in organized crime is in money laundering. Criminals from all over the world invest in the city to give themselves legitimate income from their illegal money. The figure has been put as high as four billion pounds. If a substantial part of your legitimate uh, uh, economy, the economy above the ground, uh, is in fact being undermined by money which is criminal uh, in origin, dishonest money, um, then that has a potentially corrupting effect uh, on your entire economic structure. Money laundering attracts most international criminal organisations to London. The Italian Mafia has a presence in the capital, although little is heard of its activities. The best known case in recent years was when disgraced banker Roberto Calvi was found hanging from Blackfriars Bridge in 1982. He was believed to have been murdered by the Mafia's heroin traffic manager in London, Francesco Di Carlo, although he was never charged. However, Di Carlo was sentenced by a British court to 25 years in prison for drug offences. Di Carlo owned Leo's wine bar in Streatham, South London, but his real money came from organising the Mafia's secret drugs line spreading halfway around the world. It wasn't though until a shipment of furniture arrived at Felixstowe from India in December 1984 that intelligence became evidence. Agents in Britain and Canada seized £93 million worth of heroin and cannabis. The Mafia ring has now been broken up in Britain, but the organisations believed to be already regrouping. The Italian Mafia is here and has been here for several years. We were always uh, the place uh, of rest and recuperation, to use uh, the Italian cliché. This was a place where you could take to the mattresses. The knock-on effect we're seeing uh, now uh, is of Italian uh, Mafia figures uh, who are not only here uh, for rest and recuperation or to evade attention uh, elsewhere, but are developing their activities. Um, drugs and money laundering uh, would be uh, an example uh, of that. However, it's criminals from Eastern Europe, the so-called Russian Mafia, that may become the biggest threat to Great Britain from organised crime. The murder in London in March 1993 of two Chechen brothers 
was one of the first signs of the lawlessness which is running out of control in the old Soviet Union spreading to this country. Police were first alerted to the double killing when they were called to this house in Harrow, North London. Workmen had become suspicious of a crate delivered to the garage of the house. The box was said to contain antiques, but inside it, detectives discovered the decomposing body of a Russian businessman. The subsequent search of a luxury West End penthouse revealed another murdered Russian, the brother of the first victim. Both are believed to be from the newly formed state of Shechen. Both had been shot three times in the head at close range. Ruslan and Nazarbek Utsayev were believed to control the London market in Eastern European art objects stolen from museums. A professional hitman, Gagik Tur Oganissian, was convicted of their murder. Fourteen months later, Karen Reed was shot in Woking in what was thought to be a revenge killing intended for Tur Oganissian's wife. I looked up and I could see a bloke standing at her door and he was had a gun in his hand and he could bang about well, four shots. This was an absolute callous assassination. You can't describe it in any other way. One of Scotland Yard's biggest concerns is the scale of activity in many areas of criminality in Eastern Europe that are spreading westward. Vice, drugs, extortion, kidnap, uh, money laundering, counterfeiting, violence. How much is here so far? Some. Sufficient to get our attention. The number of operations uh, that we are now running jointly uh, with colleagues around Central uh, and Eastern Europe and in the areas of policing where we are working together has exceeded uh, our predictions. I've met some foul, dangerous, evil, wicked, treacherous, violent people from I think just about every country on the globe. I wouldn't necessarily want to identify one country as being worse than the other. There just happen to be an awful lot of them in Eastern Europe at the moment. The notorious triads from Hong Kong are another criminal organization with a presence in London. They too are involved in many areas of criminal activity. This is a raid on a brothel in London run by the triads. Just keep quiet, we'll tell you everything that's going to happen in a minute. The major impact uh, of triad activity uh, within certainly London, it's true elsewhere of the United Kingdom, uh, has been upon Chinese communities. They are the victim communities um, who suffer uh, from the activities uh, of triads. London's Chinese community is the oldest and largest in Europe. Many live in fear of the violence of the triads. They will voluntarily chop people in a public place, not down a quiet black alley. They'll do it in a public place in front of people. It's a message to the community. And that's where a lot of the, the fear actually stems. It's difficult for the police to investigate any crime involving a member of a triad. Because fear of retaliation. Retaliation with the triad. You can arrest three, four, five, but what about the other people? Yeah. How are you going to stop them coming? They'll want their revenge. To watch the triads, Scotland Yard has established a Chinese intelligence unit. It's very difficult to quote exact figures, but here in, in Chinatown, perhaps 70% of the restaurants will be, will be paying some sort of protection money, maybe. There is this permanent level of fear. If you are, if you are Chinese, um, you perhaps have reason to feel frightened of triad involvement. Although at present, triad activity in London is mostly confined to the Chinese community, the worry is what may happen when the sovereignty of Hong Kong reverts to the Republic of China in 1997 and there's an exodus from the colony. There are signs that they are making arrangements to come here but they are keeping their options open as it, at the moment. Um, they are creating themselves safe havens around the world just in case things don't go their way in 1997 and yes some of them have I think made arrangements to come here. But in fighting organised crime, the 400 or so London-based major criminals are Scotland Yard's biggest concern. This is the Arif gang holding up a Securicor van in South London. They were ambushed by the flying squad and arrested. Mehmet Arif and his brother Dennis, the gang's leaders, were sentenced to 18 and 22 years in prison. 
Eight months later, a third Arif brother, Becca, was recorded by a police surveillance camera watching the arrival of another security corps van, which he was planning to rob. It has been said that there are no true Mr. Biggs uh, in British indigenous crime. My own fear is that there are people uh, who are actually allowed to become bigger uh, than they ought to have been. Um, but they are not international organised criminals. It's more like a webwork of old alliances and hatreds and um, associations. It's more about... Uh, uh, who you grew up with, who you've been in prison with, who you committed crimes with in the past, um, uh, who grasped on who. Um, uh, you all got grasped against by one person, you're inclined to come together into a cohesive group. So it's more about that. Four weeks later, Becca Arif and his gang returned to rob the security corps van. Arif is in the silver car. As the Security Corps van arrived, the flying squad moved. Becca Arif was sentenced to six and a half years in prison for conspiracy to steal and firearms offences. Another investigation which made use of many of the techniques at the Yard's disposal concerned a major South London villain, Joey Pyle. Pyle had been an associate of the Crays and the Richardsons. He was known to be involved in drugs dealing and other crimes, but had escaped any convictions for over 30 years. There's a little-known Scotland Yard squad, part of the criminal intelligence branch, whose job is to target major criminals, the Special Intelligence Section. They were given the job of trapping Joey Pyle. For months, surveillance teams watched Pyle's every move. We will find out where he's living, who he's living with. Has he any girlfriends? Has he got any soft spots? We would identify his main associates, who he mixes with, who he drinks with, where he goes to, and just generally do all the background information on it. They followed Pyle to Pinewood Studios in Buckinghamshire where he had a film company, Touchdown Productions. The SIS then had a stroke of luck. A man arrested for fraud by the City of London police, Richard Green, said he wanted to give information on Pyle. He was heavily in debt to Pyle and terrified of him. Richard, at the time, was being used by Pyle as his right-hand man. He was fronting for various operations that he might have running it at that particular time. And the information he gave us specifically related to a heroin deal, which Pyle started running when one night at, I believe at his home address, he invited Richard along and asked Richard if he knew somebody who was interested in purchasing large amounts of heroin. The SIS now placed hidden microphones in Pyle's office at Pinewood Studios. They also installed an undercover officer acting as a secretary called Lucy in an office close to Pyle's. I was there to watch for the movements of the people that uh, Joey associated with and uh, um, whenever he was in the office then I'd inform Terry and his boys that he was there or whoever may have been with him. She was in, in, a, in a lot of in a lot of danger, I'd have said. Um, uh, although we were within five or ten minutes away from her uh, as a backup. But um, I wouldn't like to think if, uh, if George found out that she was a, an undercover officer, what would have happened? I, I actually took a liking to him. He's, he's, he's a nice chap. And as, as Lucy, he was very nice to me. He did, he did chat to me and, and call me Lou, little Lou. So the next step from there was to confirm to Pyle that we wanted the deal to be brought on and we were going to introduce an undercover police officer to be our buyer. So we were relying on the credibility of Richard being the intro introductory agent of the undercover buyer so that Pyle would trust the person that was going to come into his criminal network. As surveillance on Pyle continued, Richard Green, having introduced him to an undercover police officer, was sent to prison for fraud. Really, that forced the issue because Pyle, if he wanted to carry on with the heroin deal, 
had to deal direct with the undercover police officer. By now, Pyle's every move was being watched and every conversation with the undercover officer, Steve, was recorded. They agreed to meet at the Sheraton Skyline Hotel at Heathrow, where Steve would pay £14,000 for 7,200 capsules of a drug called Omnipon. The plan was that an associate of Steve's, who was another undercover police officer, would park a red Vauxhall Astra in the car park of the Sheraton in view of Pyle and Steve and a police surveillance camera. An associate of Pyle's, Peter Gillette, then arrived and transferred the Omnipon capsules into the Astra. Is that him now? Yeah. Yeah, Sierra. Oh, good boy. Now, is he going to get round the back? Is he on his jacket? No. Right. Yeah, I think I'd do the same if it was mine. Yeah, that's my boy. It's a good lad, that's it. Is that him? Bag, yeah. No, there's no problems at all, because there's two bags in there, right? Yeah. So what's your man going to do now? He's going down a low bag me. Steve then uh, gave uh, Joe £14,000, which was the money agreed price of, for the Omnipon, and uh, Joe walked out, and Joe was then arrested. I think he was totally shell-shocked. I think he couldn't believe it had actually happened to him after all those years that he, Joey Parr, was being arrested. Um, and, I, and I think that he thought that he would still get away with it, even then. After three trials, which included attempts at jury nobbling and witness interference, Parr was convicted and sentenced to nine years in prison. But there was one unresolved aspect of the investigation. During their inquiries, police had discovered a stash of 40 kilos of heroin in a warehouse in Wimbledon. Now we were, together with Terry's people, keeping observation on that stash, which was at the time the largest ever police seizure of heroin in the United Kingdom. And we were fairly confident that in some way that heroin was part of the deal that Pyle was trying to put together. The heroin was never collected and there was insufficient evidence to charge Pyle with any offence in connection with it. Commander Grieve seldom emerges from the shadows. His concern is that anything he says may give an advantage to the highly sophisticated organised criminals from all over the world that he and his colleagues spend their lives fighting. The constant seesaw is the counterintelligence from their side. They're constantly trying to find out how we did it. So if I've been selectively enigmatic or lawfully audacious or any of the other phrases, it's because I don't wish to tell them too much because they will play this tape over and over again. We know they've played other programmes. They watch all the time. What is it they can learn? Well, I hope they haven't learnt anything that they don't already know. Well, there's one fact that I'm absolutely certain of is that we, the police, cannot do this on our own. The harsh lesson of history is that no single law enforcement agency acting on its own has ever sustained a successful attack against organised crime. The only way that this is going to be approached uh, is by a recognition of the scale of the potential threat and the impact that this may have uh, upon our lives and the lives uh, of our sons and daughters, uh, and to approach it with a recognition of bringing a multidisciplinary approach, all the appropriate talents to the table, a multi-agency approach, and undoubtedly a multinational approach. Only by that grand partnership is it going to be possible to hold the... Bank security video of a raid...